much, Dee. She's a really nice song. Thank you. I could hear really well. And now Brother Daniel Webster is going to come. And he's going to take five minutes extra overtime. <laughs> we don't want the supper to burn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to keep you from lunch. <laughs> we'll see how things go. Um, I'll just get set up here. Uh, yeah, here we are. Well, you can see a picture. Good. Morning, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Morning. Nice to see you all. Um, yeah, it's nice to be here. Such a sunny, warm day in Prince George. Somebody told me that this is one of the warmest Thanksgivings on record. I think it's supposed to get up to 22 today. So that's marvelous. We can thank the Lord for the good weather. Thank Him for all His abundance and kindness toward us. Maybe we should just pause for a minute and uh, thank the Lord and ask his blessing as we open the word of God together. Gracious Father, we thank you today. Thank you for our life. Thank you for the health we enjoy. Thank you for the days on earth that you've provided for us to get to know you and to love you and worship you. Father, as we think today on your word, we pray that you'll bless the word of God in our hearing, might encourage and warm our hearts toward Christ. We might go away full of joy and thanksgiving on this special occasion as many hearts will be lifted to you to say thank you. And you are worthy of all that thanksgiving. So Father, bless us in this little company today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I'd like to read from John's Gospel, chapter 21. John 21. I'll put my Bible here. It is John twenty-one has become, um, I think, my favorite part of the Bible. Are you allowed to have a favorite? I love John twenty-one because it shows me in a unique way the Lord Jesus, and I really appreciate it. Did that jump? It's already jumped. Oh my goodness! I got to stop this. Sorry. You're watching the, the videos before we get started here. John 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Uh, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast now, and they were not able to draw in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put, out his, put on his outer, outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little, sh uh, the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals, and there, and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net Sorry, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. 
Yet no one of his disciples dared ask him, Who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my, sh or feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? I'm sorry about this. Um, he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Amen. We'll stop there. Um, it seems my PowerPoint has got a life of its own, so forgive me if it jumps around a bit. I hope you can all hear me. I know Clayton was playing with the sound back there. Can you hear me okay? I, I don't have a voice that carries very well, so if you can't hear me, just go like this and I'll get the hint. I'll try and speak a little louder. Now, we're in John 21, and as I say, it's one of my favorite places, probably the favorite place for now, in Scripture. And it begins the chapter by saying Jesus revealed himself, and, and in this way, he revealed himself. Um, so... The chapter is about the revelation of Jesus. It's telling us about him and how he revealed himself. So that intrigues my mind. It makes me think, well, how is Jesus revealing himself to us? Um, the first thing we should notice is that in John's gospel, John's motive, his aim is to introduce Jesus to us as God, divine, God manifest in the flesh. And so he goes through a number of signs through the book to reveal this to us. And it culminates in John chapter 20 with Thomas. If you remember, Thomas was the doubter. He said, unless I see the nail print in his hand and the wound in his side, I will not believe. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the deity. That's where we're going. <laughs> um, he said, I won't believe unless I see. And Jesus appears to him and says, Thomas, reach hither your finger and put it in my hand. Take your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said these words, my Lord and my God. That's a great moment in scripture when the revelation of who Jesus is dawns on this man called Thomas. This is God. This is God standing before me. Now these men had met Jesus as fishermen by the sea, and they were um, certainly convinced that he was the Messiah. They left their nets and they followed him. He said, come and follow me. He fo they followed him. So they had confidence that this was their Messiah. And as they watched the miracles he did, as they watched uh, him walk on water, raise the dead, give sight to the blind, heal the lame, as they did all these miracles, even feed 5,000 or more people with a couple fish and uh, a few loaves of bread, in their minds they were going, wow, this man is really remarkable, this Messiah of ours. Little by little, the Holy Spirit was revealing the truth and until at last, well, let's leave it there for now. <laughs> Sorry, this thing is supposed to not jump like that. I don't know why it does. It's so excited that it just wants to get to the point. I don't know. Anyway, we're trying. Um, yeah, the point is that this is kind of, if, if you were one of those disciples, just imagine, I mean, God in the flesh. I mean, it's such a powerful idea. And all the Jews rejected Jesus because of that very point. This man makes himself out to be God. That's why they took him out and crucified him. But for these few fishermen, they actually got that revelation. They understood who Jesus was. He is divine. He is... Oh, forgive me. I don't know why it does that. Well, yes, but I've stopped the timer. It's supposed to stop. Anyway, you'll forgive me. We'll, we'll, work, that, we'll work that through somehow. Don't be distracted by flipping pictures up there. I may mean, just have to stop the whole thing. Sometimes pictures are nice because it helps us follow the story. Anyway, when Thomas said those words, my Lord, my God, it dawned on him and dawned on the others. This is not just a man, not just the Messiah, the promised one of Israel. This is God himself. This is God himself. That is the aim of the gospel. It's trying to reveal to us, you'll see his humanity too. <laughs> 
Oh my, oh my. Maybe we just let it run through. Um, anyway, but you know, when we move into John 21, we have a fishing story. And I always wondered why, do you mind if I just shut this off? It's distracting me. It's probably distracting you. If I want it, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll call up. <laughs> I'll call it up. Maybe if I do it another way. Let me try this. Um, I don't want the presenter view. That's my problem. Yeah, if I get out of here. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. I go to here. Uh, Uh, I think I just have to quit the whole thing. Just quit the whole thing. We don't need that. I like pictures. Maybe you do too, but they're not working for me today. So let's just forget that, close this, and let's just preach at you. <laughs> All right. So, yes, they've discovered that the man that they've been uh, with for the last three years is God in the flesh. And that's a powerful thing to realize. Not easy for you and I to get there. It's not easy to believe that. That's a pretty extraordinary thing to accept. But while well, John and the Holy Spirit are bringing before us this truth that we can accept, he never diminishes the humanity of the Lord Jesus. In um, this chapter, which is about some guys going fishing, fishing story, why is this at the end of this glorious gospel, this wonderful revelation of the deity of our Lord Jesus? And then there's a story about these guys going fishing. And I think, that's a strange story at the end of the gospel. But the more I've thought about it, the more I realize that this is the crown jewel of the gospel. It's an absolute marvelous revelation of who God is. Because John is saying to us, this is your God, who is also a man. He became a man. And so when they go out fishing and they're trying to catch some fish, there's a man on the shore. And he says, have you got anything? And they said, no, we haven't got anything. He says, cast the net on the other side and you'll find some. And of course, they caught a great draft of fish. Here's a, a, an intimate story between friends. Can we put it that way and still be reverent? He is God Almighty. But he can come near us and interact with us on a human level. How do we know our God? How do we experience who God is? through the person, the humanity of our Lord Jesus. They walked with him. They touched him. They handled him. They heard his voice. They saw his face. They saw a man. Now, he was God in the flesh. But God loves us, and God wants us to know him. And so he sent forth his son in the likeness of man, as a human being, so that we could know him. In John's Gospel, he's called Jesus 256 times. Only about 40 times is he called Lord. Now, if you're trying to reveal the deity of Christ, you would think the name Lord would be pretty significant in that revelation. But he shows us the man. Jesus is his human name. And so his humanity is not diminished in any way. And his humanity does not diminish his deity. That's the message we can draw from this. He is a man. But not only that, Jesus reveals to us his love. His love. Now, Peter's a fisherman. That's how he makes his money. Sometimes people go out fishing just because they like to fish. It's fun. I'm, I don't like fishing. <laughs> I don't enjoy it much at all. It seems kind of boring to me. But the guy who was staying with here in Prince George, he's got a picture of himself catching one of those huge sturgeons. Have you ever seen those things? It's massive. It's 11 feet long, massive fish. And I said, so what did you do with the fish? He says, oh, you catch and release. You catch that big of a fish and you just let it go? That not make much sense to me. But here, these men, it was their job. It was their livelihood. It's how they fed themselves. So when Peter said to his friends, I'm going fishing, they were waiting around because the Lord told them to wait. Um, but in the meantime, maybe they need a little money in their pocket. Feed the family. Look after some expenses. 
And so Peter says, I'm going fishing. Some people think Peter made a mistake. He should have done that. I'm not so sure about that. Some commentators will say Peter was kind of returning to his old job and everything. And, uh, but you know, the Lord Jesus didn't rebuke him about that. In fact, he gave him a lot of fish. <laughs> so I, I rather think that it wasn't stepping outside of God's will. He just needed a little money in his pocket. And his friend said, hey, we'll help you. Let's go out. This is what we do. We're fishermen. So this is going out to do their work. But Jesus comes along, realize that they're in need. You see, he's been on it all night, caught nothing. Bad day for fishing. Bad night for fishing. And Jesus comes alongside and says, hey, guys, you got anything? Almost seems like mockery. <laughs> you got anything? Nothing. <laughs> got nothing. <laughs> But it wasn't mockery. Jesus knew everything that was going on. He knew what their need was. And he comes alongside and says, here's the solution. Cast the net on the other side. Now, if you were Peter, what would you say? Lord, come on, we've been doing this all night. You don't think we know how to throw a net out? No, they listened to Jesus' words. They said, well, can't hurt, right? Might as well try. And when they cast it, they got this great draft of fish. So much so that they had a hard time dragging it to land. Now, there's three types of fish in the Sea of Galilee. There's a small one that's like a sardine, just a small thing. If you had 153 of those fish, I'd probably carry it myself. I'm not very strong. <laughs> there's a second kind of fish. It's called St. Peter's fish, or it's a tilapia, maybe one to two pounds, something like that. Again, two strong guys could easily pull that out of the, into the boat or whatever. But it says these were large fish, right? Did you notice that in the text? These were large fish, 153 large fish. And these fishermen marveled that the net wasn't torn. Well, there's another type of fish. It's something like a catfish. It's fairly large and grow to 10 to 15 pounds. So it seems to me it was likely that these were 10 pound fish. 10 times 153 is 1,500 pounds. That's like a Volkswagen. Imagine these guys trying to lift a Volkswagen out of the water. It was quite a catch of fish. So they marveled at it. But what it tells us is that the Lord Jesus cared about their endeavor. He cared for what they were doing and he was willing to help. You know, Jesus loves us. He loves you when you go to work and wear your work clothes. He loves you when you're at school, doing your schooling. Wherever you are, he loves you. He knows what you're trying to do and he's willing to help you. The difference being this, do we invite him to help us? Do we take him along? on the journey. This time, Jesus wasn't invited to go, but he showed up and he wanted to help. You know, Jesus is right there beside us, like that stranger on the shore. He's just close by and he wants to help because he loves us and he knows what we're trying to do. And if we listen to his voice and we obey his voice, we'll find good success. Because he loves us and he's willing to bless us. All the fish in the sea, he knew all about them and he controlled them. So all he had to do was say a word and all those fish entered that net. And they had what they needed. If we understand in life that everything that we do is under his control and he loves us, he wants to provide for us. Why do we struggle? Why do we fight through life with all the issues and problems of life? Maybe it's because we haven't Allow this dear one, Jesus, to come near and listen to his voice and say, Lord, show me what to do. And as soon as we involve Jesus, we find good success. You know, the other thing that you notice about Jesus in this chapter is that he's a friend. What does a friend do? Hey, Clayton, let's go have breakfast. Let's go to Tim Hortons, have a cup of coffee. That's what a friend does. We care about each other. We want to spend time together. Now, when they caught the fish, and they showed up on the beach. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. I just love that. I love that about our God. God in heaven, the transcendent eternal one, the one who holds our breath in his hands, the one who sprayed the heavens with stars, same one who says, Come and dine with me. Have breakfast with me. What a marvelous thing that is, that God should want to ha sit down and have a meal with me. And when we get to the fire, which has already been kindled, we find fish and bread there. And it says that Jesus took the bread 
and the fish, and he gave it to them. He served them. <laughs> Does that not marvel you? The God of heaven should come down to the earth in the person of Jesus and offer you, serve you? In the book of Revelation, it says his servants, um, he will serve. He will serve us. It also says his servants will serve him. But I, I think, you know, we'd all be kind of like Peter, you know, when the Lord Jesus came and tried to wash his feet, he said, Lord, never, never, no, you're too high and lofty to do that for me, right? I understand what Peter was feeling. And Jesus said, unless I do this for you, you have no part with me. To really understand the kingdom of God and understand our Lord Jesus is to recognize that the greatest among us is the servant of all. And that's what Jesus was. He came to serve. Here he is serving these fishermen. They've been out the whole night, the cold night, not catching anything. And now he's got a warm fire for them to sit around. Warm yourselves, eat, enjoy the food. And he gives them the food, serves them. What a beautiful picture of who our God is. <laughs> our God loves us. Our God wants to be a friend to us. I'll have to say that very carefully, very respectfully. We say, what a friend we have in Jesus. It's true, but we must never lose sight of who our friend is, the great and glorious one, the one above all. But he wants to be my friend. He wants to be your friend. That's a marvelous thing, isn't it? Not only do we learn this of Jesus in this chapter, but we also see that he's a peacemaker. This chapter is not so much about fish and friends having a meal together. It's about Jesus wanting to meet with Peter. You see, we read about the meeting with Peter. Peter, I think the Lord just loved Peter so much. Peter was a man full of faults, just like you and I. We're full of faults. Nobody here is perfect. If you think you're perfect, well, you'll have a hard time getting your way to Jesus because he deals with all our imperfections. He takes Peter. Peter made a lot of blunders, and there's a lot of them recorded for us. But one of the gravest things that he did was in the hour of trial, when Jesus was arrested and taken to the high priest's house, uh, Peter wanted to see how things would turn out. And so he followed along at a distance, and then he was warming himself by the fire in the cool of the night. And somebody came and said, you are with that man. I recognize your voice. You're Galilean. And he denied it. I don't know the man. I don't know him. And three times he denied the Lord. And the Lord Jesus in the upper room had said, you will deny me three times, Peter. Now, Peter had said on that occasion, even if all others fail, Lord, I won't fail. I'm ready to go to death for you. That's what he claimed, Matthew chapter 26. But here he had miserably failed and when, in Luke's gospel, it tells us that when the third time he denied him, that the Lord Jesus looked in his direction. Their eyes must have met. And I think it broke Peter's heart. Absolutely broke his heart. He'd let down the Lord. He let down his good, good friend. And he went out and it says he wept bitterly. He was a broken man. And yet the Lord Jesus wouldn't leave him there. Now you think of all that the Lord Jesus endured on the cross. He went there for Peter and for all of us to die for our sins, to pay the penalty. There he hung naked in all shame, in all torture the men could do to him. And then God heaped upon him the sin of us all to punish him, the weight rejected, despised, and even his own forsook him and fled. What a horrific scene of the treachery in the heart of man, the glorious grace of God. God, through all of that, demonstrated that he loves us so much, just crazy in love for us. And Jesus, now, what would you do if somebody denied you, hurt you, offended you? This happens to us sometimes. And when people offend us, we kind of have something in us that's just a little revengeful. We want to get back at them and show them, hey, you can't hurt me like that. I'll get you. Jesus had nothing like that in him. He loved Peter entirely. No matter how much Peter denied him or hurt him, he comes to Peter in this scene and he says, 
Peter? No, he doesn't say Peter. He says Simon. That was the name he had when he first met him. That might have been a little bit stinging because it takes them back to the beginning of their relationship. All that relationship they developed over that time, he'd lost that name Peter because of his denial. And he goes back to Simon. That's the man he met fishing so many years before. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these, more than these other men? Because you said you did, right? Remember that, Peter? You said you were willing to die, even if everybody else wasn't willing, you would die. And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. You know I love you. Now, they don't use the same word. In English, we read the word love in our translation, but it's not the same word. The word that Jesus used when asking the question about his love was the word that means, are you fond of me? Are you friendly to me? Do we have a good relationship as friends? That's the word he used, phileo. It's a Greek word that means being fond of, affectionate. Um, but the word that Peter used in response, sorry, I got it wrong. He asked agape. I'm sorry, I got it backwards. He said, do you agape me? That means, are you willing to die for me, Peter? Are you willing to give your life for me? And Peter's response was the first word I gave you, phileo. I'm fond of you. I like you. I respect you, but I can't come to the point of admitting I would die for you because we already know, Jesus knows, he knows in his heart, when it came down to it, I failed you. I was fearful of my own life and I, I denied you. And so the second time he asked the same question, are you ready to die for me, Peter? Lord, I, I like you a lot. I like you a lot. The third time, Jesus changed the word, and he used Peter's word. He says, do you like me, Peter? Am I important to you, Peter? Now, that's why he was grieved the third time. Not just that he asked him three times, but he changed the word. He brought himself down to Peter's level. But that's okay. Peter says, Lord, you know all things. He appeals to his omniscience. He knows everything. You know, you, you know, Lord. You know where I'm at. You know my love for you is not perfect. So you see, what, what he had done is he had exposed Peter to his own weakness and had him admit his own weakness and his love and devotion. But you know the marvelous thing? It wasn't to attack Peter. It was to help him come to terms with himself, to understand his weakness. And instead of saying, okay, well, I'll let you maybe once a month hand out hymn books at the back of the church. He didn't say that. He said, I want you to feed my sheep. Tend to my lambs. Feed the lambs. Feed the flock. Which is an amazing thing. A man who's failed so much, but he wants to give him the greatest role of all. Because there's nothing more precious to the heart of God than his people. Jesus died for them, gave his blood for them. There's nothing more valuable on this earth than God's people to the heart of God. And he says, Peter, I want to entrust you with the care of that which I love, that which I gave my life for. You look after them, you tend to them. So this story is about his love, his love for Peter, his willing to make peace with Peter. Now, when we meet Peter a little bit later, it's only John that records this episode where Jesus deals with Peter like this. If we had read the denials in the other three Gospels and then gone to the book of Acts, we'd say, what happened there? We've got this fearful coward denying the Lord, all of a sudden standing up on the day of Pentecost, this bold preacher preaching to the masses. Well, the difference is John 21, where we meet the Lord Jesus dealing with that individual. That's another beautiful thing about this gospel, is how personal it is. Like I say, when I read John's gospel, I think to myself, what a, what a transcendent book in a way to reveal the God of heaven to us, but he comes to us as a man. He comes to this man, Peter. Why does he focus on one individual? Isn't there some greater thing that could be ending this book, this, this culmination of the gospel accounts of our Lord Jesus, something greater than just dealing with one individual and his denial? 
I think that beautifully speaks to who God is. God cares about you, cares about you, cares about every one of us as individuals. You pray in your room, you pray in your room, and somebody in India is praying in their room, he hears everybody individually and loves us individually. That's very comforting to know. We're not just one among a great mass. I used to think to myself, in heaven, maybe I'll just get lost in the back of the crowd somewhere. But no, he loves me, and he loves you too. If you look at John's gospel, you'll see that he deals with Nicodemus, a woman by the well, a blind man of John 9, Mary, Martha, Lazarus in their home. It's a book that reveals the personal interest Jesus has with each one of us. He's the peacemaker. He reveals his love, his friendship for us. He is the divine son, but he is also a man. So he can be our friend. So we can interface and know him on a personal level. Above all things, he is Lord. That is the thing we must acknowledge. If we are to have a relationship with God, we must come to know him as Lord. If you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The basis of our salvation is not to know about Jesus, it's to acknowledge who he is, to recognize that he is Lord, Lord of me, Lord of my life. When I say Lord, I mean I submit to you. I recognize your authority over me, and I'm willing to follow you. Peter left his nets, and he followed him. He was obedient to the call. He put his faith in him, and God revealed himself to, to him as the divine Son of God. So our salvation rests in him. But what a wonder it is to know him. What a wonder it is. The Christian message, many people are afraid of Christianity, afraid of the Bible for all kinds of reasons. Oh, it's a bunch of restrictions and moral teaching, but they don't see the loveliness of Jesus. Jesus standing on that shore, loving those men and wanting to do good to them, just reminds us, doesn't it, that he is good. He cares. I just love it when he says, come and have breakfast. Just love that. That's who God is. That's what he wants for each of us. And he invites you to trust in him if you haven't trusted him before, so that you can experience a relationship with him, because you're very, very dear to him. So I think that's our time. I did take five minutes extra. Sorry about the PowerPoint. Hopefully it'll work this afternoon. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ in Scripture. The whole Bible speaks of him, but this beautiful portrait in John 21 reminds us that not only is he our God, he's our friend, he's a man, and we can speak to him and sit with him and dine with him. What a marvel that is to us, Father. We see him dealing with Peter, and we see such a, a desire to have an uh, unhindered relationship, peace between brethren. Father, we marvel that you have chosen this one individual, Peter, to highlight who you are. You care for the individual. And Father, we acknowledge today in your presence that Jesus Christ is Lord. We acknowledge that he has all authority and that he deserves our obedience, our faith, um, our worship. So, Father, we pray that each one will receive your revelation today and will love you more and appreciate the Son of God more and more. Bless the food we're about to take and remind us of all the good things that we have. We're just so thankful for every little mercy you show us, but especially for the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.